Hey, it's Liz Alto, and this is the Untame the Wild Soul Woman podcast. From body image, sex, spirituality, money and relationships, to motherhood, creativity, business, communication and desire, Untame the Wild Soul Woman is the place to come for real stories and powerful advice to help you reclaim and redefine womanhood in the 21st century. What's up, wild ones? This is Elizabeth Dialto. I am your host for the Untame the Wild Soul podcast, and this is episode number 135, How to Make More Money with Denise Duffield-Thomas. Yo, I loved doing this interview. Denise and I go way back many years, about almost six years now, as we met in the space of attending events and learning how to build our businesses around the same time. And it's not only been a blast to watch Denise's success unfold, which it has in a big way, but I'm also a student of hers. So in this interview, we're gonna mention and tell you about her Lucky Bitch Money Bootcamp course, which I took back in 2012, so almost five years ago. And her work was actually a core foundation of me healing so much stuff. I had a lot of crap around money, which some of you have heard me talk about in other interviews, but I had to get a lot of that stuff excavated so that I could make money, so that I could build and grow my business. And so I have benefited enormously from Denise's work. And in this interview, we are getting down and dirty with a lot of things that other people don't talk about. We talk about excuses, money blocks, the beliefs that influence your earning potential and receptivity around money, the dynamics between partners and relationships around money and work, And we talk about role models, and for some of us, that's a lack thereof, which some people can relate to. And we talk about all kinds of other things. So it's a super juicy conversation, definitely the kind you'll probably want to listen to a few times over. And if you are interested, definitely check out her Lucky Bitch Money Bootcamp course. I could not possibly recommend it highly enough. The show notes for this episode can be found at untameyourself.com forward slash episode dash 135. So any links or anything we talk about in the interview, you'll be able to find on that page at untameyourself.com forward slash episode dash 135. And let's get into it. We have another repeat guest. We've only had a handful of these. Uh, and I think it's partially because there's so many people I'm so excited to talk to that it's like kind of hard to justify having people back. But there's so many people I want to talk to again. So I'm, I'm super pumped, though. Denise was on very early. So some of you have been listening for a while, might not have even heard her first interview. You heard me introduce her already. So Denise, even though you answered this question a long time ago, I'm asking it again anyway, because it's how we always start. What do you love about being a woman? Oh, gosh. You know, I can't even remember if the first time I said it, but I went through a bit of a stage maybe five, ten years ago where I was like, this sucks being a woman in this lifetime. Who decide, Like, who made this happen? I didn't want to be a woman this time. This sucks. <laughs> and I even remember saying to my hubby and just said, oh, next time around, I'll be the man, you be the woman because this freaking sucks. And I don't know what it was at the time, but I just hadn't embraced um, – the power that women can have. I was thinking, this sucks, we get paid less and, you know, like people don't respect us. And I was just looking at all the bad stuff. And now what is so amazing since then and probably since we spoke is that women are just feeling the calling to rise up and we are being leaders and we can hold that space and we're, we're okay to hold that space for the planet because we care so much about the planet. So now I've had a complete 180 on that. I'm like, thank God I was a woman this time around. I am really appreciative of that and now is a better time, I mean the best time to be a woman that there's ever been. Yeah. And so it's just opportunity and space and creativity and the receptivity that we have because we can learn and change and adapt. So when we get this abundance piece, you know, when we really step up and be leaders around money, things are going to shift and change in the world because that's that's our superpower. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I talk about receptivity all the time. And, you know, we do. I get a lot of questions on my programs. You know, I don't specifically and intentionally teach on money, but it's related to everything else I do, like being receptive, being true to yourself, being who you are. So I do end up getting a lot of questions on money, which is why I'm super excited to have you back. So how do you... Around the money thing, I feel like where a lot of women get stuck up is where a lot of women get stuck up with, in general, is is asking. 
even asking to begin oh, with yeah. and, and the receiving part, of course. But then there's also this weird funkiness of like expecting too, because around women and there's like uh, women tend to be provided for and stuff like that. So could you just riff on like the weird dynamics in there that, I mean, you've been coaching and teaching and leading people through your course, which we'll talk about later um, for a while. So I know you've had all of this come up. Yeah. Well, let's even just talk about asking, right? Why is it so hard for women to ask for what we want? Well, we have been conditioned for a long time to um, be okay with what we're given, be grateful for what we're given. And in my family, it was you get what you're given and you'll be grateful for it is, was the way it was told to us. And so if you ask somebody, what do you really want? Sometimes people say a really vague thing, oh, I just want to be happy or I just want more money and you go well there's a lot in that you know how do you want your life to be what would you like it to look like how do you want to wake up we're completely unused to asking for what we want because we don't know a lot of the time we have this vague sense and obviously when you have a vague sense and you send out vague requests to the universe you're going to get vague stuff back right and that asking also goes into if you're in a business you're not asking for the sale. You're not asking people to work with you. You're give, maybe you're giving, and I see this a lot in the spiritual community where people like give angel card readings or something, mm-hmm. and they like mm-hmm. give it, but then there's no. All they have to do at the end is say, "Hey, you know, you've had this free experience. If you want to work with me, here's a link." Like it doesn't have to be anything more than, "Would anyone like some coffee?" Like as simple as that. But we're not even used to being able to to ask that way because we feel greedy. We feel we're, like we're being unethical um, and we're just not allowed to choose. We have to just be happy with what we've got and be content. And you can be content but still want to be more, do more, have more and expand more. Yeah. So it's funny you mentioned greedy because as you were talking, I was making a note. I wrote fear of being or appearing greedy because I think that's a big one because I think our, our all of our cultures still have this connotation with like also the really funky dynamics between money and power and that if someone wants money, they're not going to do good things with it. And guess what? There are people like that in the world. We see it all the time. We see it right now, right happening right now, right? <laughs> Where we're seeing people um, who shall not be named, um, <laughs> who are gr- horrible, greedy people who have done shitty things with their money. And the fear is, I think, that if we have money, we'll, we'll be like them. Mm. And that is the stupidest thing if you really think about it because if you think of people we know in our communities who have money they are um helping other women they are hiring other women to help them in their business and in their life they're spreading the abundance they're buying things from makers and you know it we should be the ones to have more money because, hey, the people that we know are doing amazing things and will do amazing things with more money. So if you think, oh, God, you know, all these horrible, greedy people, rich, you know, rich people are greedy, well, not your kind of rich people, not the new, new money that we're a part of. We're not going to be like that at all. We're not. Yeah, I love that so much because I even remember, like, one of my biggest, as you know, as you know, I can't believe, by the way, I was in my car um earlier thinking about this interview and i was like calculating in my head how many years ago i did your course it's almost five years now you're gonna be kidding me (laughs) yeah five years in january that made me feel not old but just like what the hell five years went by but um yeah what i think is so fascinating is one of the things that i was so motivated by i couldn't wait to have more money so i could actually do more nice things, like do more generous things that at the time when I couldn't even pay my friggin' rent, it was like if someone was in need, like my basic needs weren't even being met. So like I literally couldn't wait to have more money to be able to like donate to organizations or like be able to help someone out if they needed it as so many people had helped me when I needed it. Yeah, absolutely. And you don't need to worry about money making you a horrible person unless you're already a horrible person and then money is just going to contribute to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Money's not going to turn you into anything. And money in itself is not moral or immoral. Um, We've created labels on that. And, yeah, lots of horrible, greedy, horrible people have money. 
not because it's a worth thing or a deservedness thing. It's because they they probably just really 100% believe they deserve it and there's no blocks there. They're just yes, like, yes. Yeah, I'll, have, I'll have more money. Whereas the people who really should have more money are the ones who are like, do I deserve this? Am I allowed to have money? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of my coaches said something once about like, do you think drug dealers are like worried about whether or not they should be having money? Like, no, and that's why they have tons of money. But she also drew this spectrum how sometimes when people have like a lot, a lot, a lot of money, there's not a lot of consciousness. And sometimes when people are like really, 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 really heart-based, heart-driven, there's not a lot of money. And so I think that's kind of the spectrum that you were just talking about. Absolutely. And maybe we believe that in some ways that I can be the broke hippie, but very moral and giving and loving, or I can be this rich bitch and there's no shades of gray in yeah. between. Yeah. And the reality is you can create whatever kind of wealth you want and and you can be whatever kind of wealthy person you want to be. Yeah. And I think you make an amazing point, which I know this is something that you teach in your course. It's the blocks. Like it's it's unbelievable to me. And this is why I'm always happy to like let people know about your course and interview you and like shout from the rooftops because it took me many, many years. Like I was like kind of chipping away at my money stuff for years. And then your course kind of helped me take a bunch of the books that I'd read, a bunch of the concepts and go, oh, and actually clear big, big, big stuff out that like it it just went. It wasn't like, oh, yeah, I'll put a little dent in that. It's like, see you later. Yeah. And the thing is with with this stuff, it's going to creep up again if you want to go to the next level or if you yeah, want to make yeah. more money. So you have to be in, you have to be in communities where people are constantly talking about this. So you don't lose the muscle memory, mm-hmm. you know, like so you don't just forget it and and backslide because you're not you don't have the support. You need community around you of people who are talking about how they spend their money and to be inspired about how people are spending their money and giving their money and even earning their money, you need to you, you need to see good examples of that. Otherwise, your mind will automatically go to one of those two kind of stereotypes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I forget sometimes that I am surrounded by a lot of people, and I do choose to speak with people a lot who are on the same wavelength. And I forget that it's kind of still a thing that some people think it's um, inappropriate to talk about money. Yeah. <laughs> well, or sex, right? Or yeah, all the stuff yeah. that you talk about. It's like. There's taboos around, oh, well, it's, you know, it's vulgar to talk about those things. And But you know what? Now's the time. Look at all the things that are being spoken about now around, um, you know, about treatment of women and rape culture and all this stuff. It's all bubbling to the surface because there's new ways of dealing with stuff. There's going to be new yes. ways of talking about it. And it feels ugly. And that's how it is when people deal with their money blocks. Sometimes they're like, I don't want to look at it. I don't want to look at the ugliness. Well, we, if we do that, it's never going to be as scary as you think, but it's creating new things, new way of being. Yeah. Oh, my God. I can attest to that. I had a, a thing happen. This was so silly. Um, I missed a deadline, so I was filing my taxes at the time we're recording this, just a, like last week. And I, for a couple <coughs> of years there, I didn't have a bookkeeper because I wanted to be looking at my own money because I used to be like that. If I just don't look, maybe it'll get better. And that was never true. So once I started looking at it, and what I noticed over the course of the two years I didn't have a bookkeeper is gradually over time, I wouldn't get like that agita, right? Like that anxiety when I sat down to look at my money. And so about a month ago, I, I hired a bookkeeper this year. So I canceled my bookkeeping software, not knowing that I wouldn't have, I thought I'd be able to still log in and look at the old stuff. And that wasn't the case. And so because it was for a last tax year, I had to pull up that stuff and redo the thing and actually go through and categorize some stuff. I lost some work and I didn't care. Like I had so much fun. I went to coffee shop, did some co-working with some friends, like popped in some headphones, put on some music. And that was like a big victory. Actually, when I was done, I turned around to the people around me and I'm like, I need a high five from everybody because <laughs> that was a big deal for me. <laughs> yes. Um. So something I said today was a new mantra that I'm trying out and it's, I'm not triggered by that. And there's stuff that you're going to deal with, right, around your money and stuff that used to trigger you maybe at the beginning because you were just scared of like, oh, I'm going to get in trouble if I don't have my books in, uh, you know, oh, I'm going to get in trouble with the IRS, like all those feelings and blocks and, you know, that stuff. Now, and 
and boundaries with clients and increasing your prices. I'm just trying out this new mantra of just like, I'm not triggered by that. I can, because it's that feeling of, I can deal with this. I know how to deal with this. I'm not going to get in trouble and I can just deal with it. And I actually met my accountant yesterday because we do quarterly meetings. My taxes um, for the next year will be a quarter of a million dollars, right? And he goes, I'm really sorry, bad news. And I said, Craig, I'm not triggered by that. I'm all good with paying taxes. I can handle it. And it felt like this new victory because at the start of your money journey or your business journey, you're triggered by everything. Like everything. <laughs> like, oh, it's so scary. It's so true. And I think, yeah, you're just getting to a point. And it's not like you get to a point everything's going to be perfect, right? Because sometimes deadlines get missed and you have to pay fines or, you know, you're not perfect with stuff. And that's not the point. The, uh, the, the, it's not the goal is an absence of blocks is what I'm trying to say yeah. that you just want to get to a place where you know you can deal with shit yeah but I'm untriggered by that I love that so much and so I actually want to ask your opinion on something related to what you just said I, I know you've been a student of the law of attraction a teacher of the law of attraction in your own way for many years and I think yeah. one of the things people get hung up on, I'm always trying to like debunk the, the crappy teachings of the law of attraction. I think yeah. people get really obsessed with that if it's even a tiny twinge negative, I, I can't be programming that in my mind. So even saying I'm not triggered by that, I could just hear some people going, well, should I even be talking about triggers? Because I don't want to like call them in. So in your understanding and in your how you do things, why is it okay to say I'm not triggered by that? And to not have to like reframe it in a positive way. Oh gosh, this is such a great question. No, seriously, I meet people all the time who've been students of personal development for many, many, many years and they're freaking broke. So if positivity was enough to clear your money box, then everybody would have more money, especially in our industries, right? Because it's like you can read tons of books and go like Walk on hot coals at Tony Robbins. This ain't going to like fill your bank account. Yeah. What is going to help is if you go to the dark side temporarily, you're not going to call it in, but you have to uncover it. You have to look at it. Um, you have to be okay to look at it. Mm. And um, it's safe for you to look at your, your dark stuff because that's the way through. That's how you, you, you know, you get rid of it all. So one of the exercises actually on the money boot camp is called, um, unintended negative consequences and it's about looking at the every bad side of your dream coming true like if you had more money what's all the bad stuff that's going to happen and at first people resist it because they go no you know I'm getting wealthier in every way and every day I'm getting (laughs) richer and richer and you go yeah but you're not like so why well actually you're not aren't you yeah yeah you're not no amount of affirmation going to change that so why and then they go but but I do want money and I go yeah I do believe you 50% and 50% of you does not want money because there's some really bad shit that's going to happen and I just did a webinar earlier this morning and I said what do you think you have to give up to make more money and it was like oh my god page after page time with my kids my integrity my freedom my health my relationship good sex time off my introversion all this stuff that we think, oh, my God, I have to give up. All, trust me, all that stuff lives in you anyway. You yeah. may as well look at it and acknowledge it and then you can work on it. Otherwise, you are going to be like this all the time. And that's the problem. It's like you can't affirm your way out of your blocks. You can't um, love and light. You can't light an abundance candle and that's, that's enough. You have to go to the dark side. You know, I was, I have a couple friends who I joke about this with all the time and people are just like, well, I'm manifesting. It's like, you're not doing shit. Or then when they got something and they're like, I'm, I've watched people like use every ounce of like grit and will they have to make things happen and then say they manifested it. And it's like, you worked your ass off for that. Like you, or, yeah. or, or you straight up, you bought it or, or like you went, you did all these things. So like. Yeah. We really, I think, I don't want to say we because I don't do that anymore. I used to. But people really misconstrue these concepts. They do, but I want to push back on one thing, right, because manifesting just means making it real. Yeah. So whatever way that comes to, and you know what a great way to manifest something is? To buy it, to yes. have the money to buy it. So you don't always have to magic things into your life. You know, yes. I, at, in my early days of 
um, personal development, I was I used to win stuff free shit all the time, right? Because the universe was still giving it to me, but I just had no money. And then now I realize, like, you don't have to go through the mental gymnastics of trying to um, get something for free or find ways to kind of magic. Sometimes you can just buy it with money, yeah. you know, but like that's also kind of manifesting it. But it's just this feeling that um, you can just sit at home and meditate and that's going to Yeah, that's, that's what I'm talking forward. about. When yeah, people are out giving the impression that they're not like working really hard for things <coughs> or that it, it appeared as if by magic and it's like, no, like you busted your ass for that and that's okay. Yeah. And you know what? There's two camps around this. There's the people who just want to do the woo-woo stuff and take no action, like, you know, uh, vision boards and all. And that's really cool, but that's one part of it. And then there's the people who just do the action and they just push their way through it with yeah. willpower, like you are yeah. talking about. But then they don't do any of the stuff to make it easy and flow mm-hmm. and, you know, all the feminine magic kind of stuff. Both of those are kind of unhealthy. You have to find the, the right mix of of both the practical and the magic stuff because there's no denying that when you uh, really look at the law of attraction, there is an element of the universe meets you halfway. Yeah. But sometimes the universe is waiting for you and you're just sitting at home. Yeah, totally. <laughs> the, universe, <laughs> the universe is at the halfway point going, um, this is awkward, <laughs> and you're at home going, you're at home going, the universe will come to me. The universe will just knock on my door and bring everything. He was like, no, that doesn't happen. That's so funny. I read a lot of, have you ever read any Florence Scovel Shin books? <laughs> yes. And when I read it, I really got, I was like, she could have been like my best friend. Totally. You know, like she would have been it totally in our posse, right? Yeah. And she, when was it? Like the 30s or something? Like the 20s like, or 30s. Really, really old school. She, she would have totally been our homegirl. When I was reading it, I was like, this is all the stuff I talk about in my book. And it makes you realize there's nothing new. There's nothing new. Nothing new. So for anyone listening, Florence Scovelshin, really like old school, 1920s or 1930s metaphysician. Um, But one of the things that she does, which I love this, is she quotes the Bible a lot. And I remember a couple years ago, I was reading this little green abundance book. It was like 2013. And at the time, I was really at odds with religion and anything to do with religion. So even like the mention of like Jesus Christ, I was like, I'm not reading this book. Not for me. But what's (laughs) interesting is she quotes the Bible a lot and then basically translate it, translates it like with no charge into like what it actually means. So the reason I even bring her up is because the thing that you were saying about, oh, I want to just like sit and meditate and like stare at my vision board and not take any action. That doesn't work. She, she says this thing from the Bible, which is faith without works is dead. And that just means like, yep, set your intention. Yep. Do your meditation. Yep. Say your prayers. Thank your angels, whatever it is that you're doing. And then like you go move your feet too. like you go like, yeah, I always think that Rumi quote, like what you seek is seeking you. And I always imagine that like it's coming and I'm moving and like, um, we are going to meet in the middle somewhere. Oh, absolutely. And it's, you got to do both. You know, yeah. you absolutely have to put your, put your feet into it. I a hundred percent agree. So how do you, you personally, how do you strike that balance? What do your own in terms of, because you're, this is something I've always appreciated about you. And I think we did talk about boundaries last time. I think you're just awesome with your time. You're really clear on what you're a yes for, what you're a no for, what you're willing to do, what you're not. And especially now that you have two kids, how do you, how do you strike? I don't love the word balance, but between the like (coughs) feminine stuff and the masculine stuff. Yeah, like when I talk about work-life balance, I talk about it in the way that you love your life and you love your work so much that there are, you don't need to compartmentalize them. Yeah, and that's really key because people sometimes ask me, "How many hours, you know, do you work, Denise?" And I'm like, "Well, you know what? I think about my business, well, not my business. I think about my work, mm-hmm. as in I think about the concept of money and women, twenty-four-seven, uh, like." all the time yeah is that working I don't know right you know when I'm uh three o'clock in the morning breastfeeding George um you know I'll I might check into one of my group I might sometimes um make a note about one of my books is that working like is that you know yeah it is so I think when you're in the flow of your calling you don't care but there has to be a good balance and I think people feel like they're out of balance um, it's a feeling. So sometimes when I do these calls, I've done about 15 this week, people at the end go, 
thank you so much. I know you're a busy woman. And I go, stop. I know we're just about to finish this call, but I have to say I'm not busy. I'm not a busy person. I don't stress about my time because I flow in and out of, of that and I try and just make time for everything. I'm not perfect with it. And maybe that's the thing. A lot of the time when people ask me questions about their particular blocks, particular things, it comes down to this feeling that women have that we have to be perfect or it doesn't count or we're not allowed to have abundance and we have to be super organized or we have to be, um, you know, compartmentalizing each part of our life to make it um, worthy. And it's really not. Yeah. I love like that. that. I do the same thing. I get messages from people all the time. I know you're super busy and I always do the same thing you do. Like, I'm like, uh, you'd be shocked at how not busy I am. <laughs> exactly. And, but on the boundaries thing, the thing that I, I took out, I feel busy if I have to do shit that I don't, don't want to do. That's what makes people feel busy. If, you, if you're choosing the stuff that you do, you're never going to feel busy. Yeah, you might feel full and there's sometimes when I'm like, get in the car, we need to go somewhere. Um, but it's very <laughs> rare. Like it's rare that I feel um, obliged to do stuff. And that means you have to look at every part of your life. Are you working with the cl- types of clients that you want to work with? Are you hanging out with people that you want to or out of obligation? It, all the obligation shit makes you feel busy and it makes you feel burdened, you know, and get rid of that shit and you won't, you won't even think about the B word. Yeah. Yeah. It's banned in our house, really. I love that. And even like the O word, right? Like obligation. I get it. I can't. It's, I'm the same as you. If anything feels even remotely like an obligation, it makes my skin crawl. And I know some people listening are probably, I always like to address this. People hear me say this with all kinds of people. I think people go easy for you. And people always, uh, not always, let me not exaggerate. I think a lot of times people go, easy for you, you're an entrepreneur, or easy for you, like you're a white woman in America or Australia or whatever. But I, I think there's, you've had all kinds of people from all over the world in your course. So I, w- I would love to know some examples, if you can think of any, of people who are just <coughs> making it happen in unlikely, they're defying the, the odds that culture imposes on us. Yes. So again, on my call this morning, I said, what's your excuse? You know, what is your excuse for why you're not allowed to have money? And the excuses came through like, I'm an introvert. I have, I'm black. I can't do it. I am too young. I'm too old. I'm sick. I'm tired. Kids. One person was like, I'm pregnant. I'm so tired. Um, I, I'm not pretty enough. I'm not skinny enough. That came up so much. People like too fat. I'm too fat to be rich. And we've got all these excuses, right? And this is what I said to those people. I said, first of all, find someone who's done it in your skin or in your flavor or whatever. And if you can't find one, guess what? That's your job. Yeah. (laughs) Like, I'm sorry, but that's your calling. Like, if you're like, oh, no one with my skin color is being able to do this. No one from my town has been able to do this. No one who's as young as me or as old as me or as fat as me or as blah, blah, blah than me, if no one's done it, which they probably have, you just haven't found them yet, that's your job and you have to step up and you have to be the leader from someone else and not let it be your excuse. So one example, um, we've got someone um, who has chronic illness, you know, and she had started a little business now. She's a VA. She's completely new. She's on government assistance. She's completely gifted that. We've had tons of um, women who have let their partners be their excuse. That's a big one as well. Well, my partner, you know, my husband's really negative about money. It's like, well, tough tits. <laughs> you know, you can't, <laughs> yeah, you can't let them be your excuse. And we've got um, so many women there who have completely transformed their relationships yeah. because they haven't let their partners be their excuse. For some of them, that that has meant a transition out of their relationship, sometimes with love, sometimes not so much. Sometimes it's been... Um, bringing their partner on board so they can manifest together, which is incredibly powerful. And, you know, every, I would say there's just people from every kind of walk of life. We've got musicians, like, so people who are just like the broke, starving, touring musician who, you know, would sleep on people's floors and go do gigs to suddenly, you know, having so much more abundance and to, um, uh, support themselves through their art. We have got children's book authors, we've got tarot readers, we've got business coaches, of course, because, you know, business coaches are everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> um, everywhere. We've got yoga teachers. 
uh, just from all sorts of different professions and walks of life. And every single one of those women probably had a big excuse when they started. Money blocks doesn't work for my industry. I can't make more in my industry. I can't because of X, Y, Z. Um, you know, we've all got our own excuses. I had a big excuse too around um, being Australian, which is weird. And like, I was like, oh, I'm too short to be rich. <laughs> um, you know, I'm like, I need to lose weight first. I'm not this, I'm not that. Everyone's got their own excuses and most of the time they're total BS. Totally. And you know what? I actually remember one of mine being, I just never really wanted to work that hard. Um, yes. I'm not a lazy person, but I just, something <coughs> in me knew that I didn't have to work so hard and like stress out, make myself sick, kill myself the way I see a lot of people doing. And so my fear was like the more money I had, the harder it was going to, it was just going to be more complicated. And I really wasn't yeah. interested until I realized that like money is literally just like a choice amplifier. Like the more money you have, the more agility you have actually to take those irritating, annoying things off your plate um, you know, like I know you talk about this, like get a cleaner for your house, like these things that actually make you feel super abundant that don't even have to be that expensive. Um, just it's really cool on not just the mindset shifts, but trying them out because I think sometimes people judge mm. it without trying it. Like I remember, do you know Sarah Jenks? Yes. Yeah. Not well, but I, I follow her on Instagram. Oh yeah. Oh, she's great on Instagram. Sarah was on the podcast a while ago and I remember we were talking about you know, some women really have a tough time being indoctrinated into motherhood. And she was talking about whatever you can do to like get some help, do it. And I got like one really angry comment from someone who was like that easy for you thing, right? Like I can't afford that. I'm going to, but the thing is this, I feel like the people who make it happen always find a way, right? Like sure. Okay. Maybe you can't afford the like on the books person, but like maybe your neighbor's kid is trying to make some money and like they don't mind coming and like mowing your lawn or like cleaning for like five bucks or something. I just feel like people can be a little more innovative and creative. <coughs> I'm so glad you said that because it's the truth, you know, and sometimes I want to say to those people, well, what's going to change? Yeah. Like, what do you think is going to change? Do you think you're going to win the lottery and then someone's going to give you permission to, to do the things you want to do? But also we actually have a whole session about this in the boot camp about free and low cost upgrades you can make yeah. because if you're not taking care of yourself, you're not wearing your perfume and, um, treating yourself beautifully now, what makes you think that just layering money on top of that is going to really change your behavior? Because yeah. it's usually not. Like if you can't accept abundance and receive what you have now, no amount of money is really going to change that. So that's where we start with, um, you know, maybe you you wear your perfume, you use your beautiful makeup. And I know Sarah Jenks, Jenks talks a lot about that too, like not waiting on the weight. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing. Stop waiting on the money to be able to treat yourself. Do what you can with what you've got right now. Yeah. And even people um, go, oh, I can't work on my business right now because I need help, but I've got kids and my hubby won't let me pay for daycare until my business starts making money. It's like this chicken and egg thing, right? Yeah. And it's like, well, what do you think is – when do you think that's ever going to change? Sometimes you have to make – that sort of short-term sacrifice yeah. um, and leap of faith to start, you know, giving yourself time and space to create something different. Yeah, and that kind of relates to the the Florence Scovel Shin, the faith without works, because you need to demonstrate your faith. You can't just say yeah. it. You can't just be like, yeah, I believe, like, Om Shanti, I got this. You need to actually take action steps that show that you do believe that. So one of my teacher trainers, I have a woman in teacher training. I remember we got on a call. She's like, I'm just, I'm not really working that much right now. I don't know how I'm going to pay for it. I'm like, cool. What else, what else can you do? Like, what skills do you have? Like, could you get a part-time job? Could you? And she's like, oh yeah. And she just like, two days later was like, oh, I just picked up two social media clients and like, now I can make the monthly payment and I'm good to go. Sign me up. And I'm like, that's freaking yeah. awesome. Like there's, there's always a way if you just, I think sometimes too, people get really stubborn or it's almost like there's an element of entitlement to it too, that they don't want to do, they want what they want, but they're not willing to do whatever it takes to get it. They're only willing to do certain things. And if those certain things aren't working out, they're like, well, I can't do it. Yeah. And I'll hand on heart say that one of the secrets to my success is I'll always fucking find a way. Yeah. Like I will, <laughs> you say no and I'll be like, okay, don't worry. I've got five other backup plans. Yeah. And some of that's just my personality, but my hubby sometimes is just like, Oh, that didn't work. And I'm like, 
all right, what's the next one? What's the next thing? What's the next thing? Let's do it. Um, because I'm moving forward anyway. And I even said to him early on in our relationship, I'm like, dude, I know where my life is going. I have got a massive vision for my life. You're coming or you're not, but I'm not holding myself back to make you feel more comfortable. Totally. And, you know, so at the point we had those awkward conversations where I'm like, dude, I'm working on my money mindset now and you, you are being shit around money. You need to get on board this money manifesting train. And because, and he feel he knows that even when, um, we had a very difficult conversation last year because I said, so Jim, it's time for you to quit your fucking job. I said, I'm so sick of only being able to go on holidays when your boss says we can go on holidays. And this was when I was already at the million dollar mark, by the way, in business. So we could have afforded to take but it was this mindset of like, oh, what are, what are people going to think of me if I, if I don't have a job? And I, that was a difficult conversation we had last year. I said, I, this is my vision for my life and it's always been the vision that we both have freedom and abundance in our life you are in a job and that is fucking burning like bumming me out that you're in a job right now and you do not need to be so you need to quit your freaking job and um so don't think that you know everyone else has just got it perfect you have to sometimes have those hard conversations with your partner and bring them on board totally well and again there's actually i'm working on my second book right now the courageous conversation book because Life is literally Ooh. a series of uncomfortable conversations if you want it to be the way you want it to be. Oh, that's business in a nutshell, right? It's fucking awkward conversation <laughs> after awkward conversation. <laughs> yes. And that's, I actually have an ebook called Money, I think it's awkward money conversations made easy because it is. It's, you have to just have the courage to just be like, yep, I'm going to, I can deal with that. Or, yeah. you know, as I was saying, I'm not triggered by that. I can yeah, set I those that so much. and I can make that. All right. I really, I want to come back to what you just said about, <clears throat> I'm not going to hold myself back to make you comfortable. So our culture at large, and I love talking to people about this. I talked to Amy Porterfield about it a couple months ago. There's a lot of women now making more money than men. And, and men really are kind of raised to believe that their net worth is their self-worth. So it's like a, oh, it's, yeah. it's a shitty thing. And, and I can, I can <clears throat> see where your husband, that, what are people going to think of me if I don't have a job? Because what's really interesting is, yeah, as women are on the rise and our culture is a lot more accepting of women being more successful, I don't necessarily know that the culture is getting more accepting of men maybe staying at home and being a stay-at-home dad or maybe not being the breadwinner or like doing these like menial jobs if their wife is like balling out and that that's okay. There's still a lot attached to that. Oh, I'm so, I love, you just go there, right? It's juicy, so juicy. So for me, I had to really help Mark unpack that. And um, I was saying to him, what are you afraid of? And he was like, well, what am I going to tell people that I do? Mm-hmm. You know, and I was like, because that's a huge identity. Like, as a man, huge. though, it's so big. Like, I don't think we can understand that. What did he say? He, well, he, I said to him, well, okay, well, let's unpack that even more. What are you really afraid of? And he goes, well, I don't want us to get rid of our nanny, and I don't want us to get rid of our, like our cleaner. And I'm like, dude, do you think I'm gonna make you like be my bitch? <laughs> like, I'm like, we don't have to give up any of that like what are you thinking and then I said well, why don't you do some like EFT and tapping on it and he was like what and I went oh my god I forgot that we immerse ourselves in these amazing communities where it's normal and natural for us to talk about what we're scared of yeah we're like you know like girlfriends hey I've got this thing I'm really scared about it oh, I'm dealing with this. Mm-hmm. he didn't have that no. so I was just assuming because I talked about it all the time that somehow he was as well that he was in the same conversation as me and he was like I'm like I could see it he was like he's really scared and he didn't have any outlet for it so I was like okay let me let me help you I had way more compassion after that because I went oh my god I forgot how much support I have to do this and then um I basically like we had words where I said look this is this is basically an ultimatum at this stage you know of you have to do this and then he became okay with it. You know, he started talking to his coach. He, he um, has a coach as well. And then here's the thing. He started to tell his clients and he said, I'm, um, you know, quitting to do some stuff for myself, spend more time with my family. 100% of people, he told, said, I wish I could do the same. Totally. And I, it fucking breaks my heart when, you know, there's people going, 
I asked my boss, like these are men saying to him, I asked my boss if I could work part time when my last kid was born and they said no. Mm -hmm. And they're like, I wish I could spend more time with my kids. And it just makes me fucking, it's heartbreaking that they feel like they can't do it because it's so, it feels so socially unacceptable for them. And now I said to Mark, you're in just such a great place. You can just, you can be the role model for people. And now he has embraced it. You know, he's, He's walking around town in his Lululemon stuff and going to his <laughs> in Lululemon. And he's just like, yeah, this is, he's so embraced it now. But it took him, he had to go through that fear of like, what are people going to think? Yeah. And you, the only thing people are thinking is, fuck, I wish I could do that too. I think that's, again, just so amazing. It's kind of like a couple of things we said earlier about you have to do the thing. Sometimes you have to say the thing to see the response you're going to get. Because in your mind, you're telling yourself people are going to judge me. They're going to think I'm not a man or like call me a pussy. And you also bring up such an amazing point that like he didn't have an outlet. Like dudes, a lot of men don't have safe people that they can bring that stuff to without being put down in some way, shape or form. There's this comedian, this American comedian, Bill Burr. Have you ever heard of him? Yeah, yeah. He does this skit about how like men are just are so horrible to each other. Like you want to do anything and someone's going to call you a pussy. It's like, you want an umbrella? <laughs> you fag. Like that's like his, his words, not mine. But like, so true. and the thing is, it's like an extreme. It's a joke. But then you understand like there's truth in the joke. And even though, you know, yeah. we all want to be like patriarchy, men, Donald Trump. Argh, like there's a lot of reasons why a lot of men are shitty. And it's because they've had to stuff all the things that we're totally allowed to talk about their whole lives. Oh, yeah. They don't have the support for it. But now, um, like my friend Tammy, her husband quit his job, again, very reluctantly at first. (laughs) And then within a couple of months, they're like, hey, do you want to meet up and like play Frisbee, you know, at (laughs) like 11 o'clock on a Thursday? And then they're like, this is kind of (laughs) cool. And That's awesome. the other thing um, too that, you know, because Mark was a sports marketing consultant, that's what he did. He worked in major soccer clubs like Manchester United Football Club. And so when when he was like, what am I going to do? I was like, just do your, like what you're doing but freelance, right? So yeah. he um, he started that. But then our accountant and his coach said to him, Denise is making a lot of money right now. Like have you thought of working in her business a little bit? And because it didn't come from me and it came from like, other men in his life he was just like oh wow and now he's realizing hey you know the massive opportunity in our family is for us to go all in in Denise's business so that's why he's been helping me because now he can say oh wow that can he feels like he's it's a part he's contributing to it now yeah and it's but it's been you know it's been a journey for sure and now he'll say something he's starting to learn about internet marketing so he's like well Jeff Walker said we should do it this way (laughs) and um he'll go oh yeah, you'll be like, oh, have you ever considered like doing this? And I'm like, yeah, dude, thank you for mansplaining my business to me. I totally <laughs> do that. Right. So there's some new, yeah, there's some stuff for us to work out. But there. at least but it's sweet. It's cool. Yeah, that's so. Thanks for mansplaining to me this shit that I've been doing for like six years. <laughs> yeah. But thought that yeah. counts for sure. So that's awesome. <laughs> I, I'm really glad we got to go there and have that conversation because I'm really passionate. We have a lot of conversations on the podcast about masculine and feminine energy, about, you know, being a woman in our culture, being a man in our culture, and and all and everything in between, right? Because there's so much fluidity with that stuff these days. And it's it's just cool to hear how different people have navigated the tougher stuff because it's like it's super true yeah. all over the place. And we're still working on what that means for yeah. us and where, you know, we don't have it perfect, but um and at the moment, you know, I'm doing these calls, I'm doing webinars, and he's got the kids at, he's taking them out to the cafe, and he is spending so much time with our kids. Like, it's such a gift for them and for and for him, but also for other men to see it and to have the permission to do the same. Yeah. And we're just, we're still working out what that means for us and our family, and, you know, we're not perfect. But it's it. cool that you're a, one of a few examples that I can think of or that I've ever known That I could be like, no, yo, they do it. This is a thing. You know, it's cool that you're modeling it. Because I think think so much of what people are healing from, recovering from, dealing with when they take courses like yours and they're looking at their money blocks is that none of us, I don't want to say none. That's an exaggeration. So many of us just straight up didn't have role models for all the things that we now struggle with. No, absolutely. Um, 
I didn't. And But also it's not about a matter of growing up rich versus growing up poor because now that I've seen so many women, we've had almost 3,000 women go through the boot camp, I see that it doesn't matter actually how much money you had as a kid. You can have money blocks because it's all about the stories yes. and the beliefs that have come from that. And you could have um, had a really poor family and you come up with the belief, oh, you have to work really hard to make money. But you could have had a really rich dad who was a lawyer who worked 100 hours a week and you still have that belief that you have to work hard to make money and everything in between. So it's... um. It's not so much the reality of how much money we have sometimes to what we, how we feel about money. It's so, it's fascinating. So I won't throw specific family members under the bus, but just suffice it to say, over the summer, I did this promotion. I did this pay what you can day. Um, it was really just like a thing in my heart. People advised me not to do it. I put a thousand dollar course on a pay what you can day. And I yeah, thought yeah. like 100, maybe 150 people would sign up. Almost 700 people signed up. We were like crying all day. It was like, it was, it was a really beautiful, really fun, really rewarding thing for everyone involved. And I was telling some family members about it. And it was really interesting. One of their responses, because I was celebrating after, like that day of, I went and like I checked myself into the Ritz Carlton. <laughs> I was like, I've never <laughs> been to a Ritz before. Like, this is how I'm going to celebrate. I'm going to like anchor this in and like have an ocean view room and like really take this in that like I do deserve this and I created this thing and I did something out of my heart to be generous and look what happens when you get to do things like that. And one of my family members was like, that's so cool. Like we should do something like that sometime talking about the celebration. And the other family member made this like shitty comment. And I was just <laughs> like, and if you look at the level of success, the level of income between those two people, you're like, oh, this makes total sense that the person who was like, that's so cool, that's amazing, does well. And the person who like had a shitty thing to say about me celebrating is like, not really doing so hot. So it's totally <laughs> the stories, yeah. the beliefs, the like, all that stuff. Oh, it's so fascinating to look at. And, and now I think of it as fun, but it was not fun when I was doing it. <laughs> No, it's not. But also, again, sometimes at the start of your business, you are really susceptible to that kind of comments, right? Because you have no armor, you have no community to help you. Mm -hmm. And you have to be so careful at different points. I think when you're going to the next level, or you're trying something new, you become vulnerable again. Yeah. And you have to be yeah. so careful about who you share your money stuff with. Totally. Um, yeah, because you can be vulnerable to it. I remember I had a chiropractor who was like a 55-year-old guy, right, old white dude. And he said to me, he goes, hmm, I don't think you should call your company Lucky Bitch anymore. And I was like, oh, really? Why Why would I even Why would I even tell you about my business? Because right? I wanted approval. And um, he goes, "He goes, I think it, it implies that you think you're better than everyone else. And I, was, I went away from that chiropractic session it wasn't a business coaching session I came away from that thinking he's right I need to change the name of my business and it's because at that time I just didn't have a good community around me I didn't know who to talk to about money and I was so susceptible to everyone else's thoughts and feelings about it and you know you need to get to a place where you can armor yourself and protect yourself but be in the right communities <laughs> yeah and I think that applies to anything not just money like you're doing anything you're studying something you're exploring a new belief system like don't tell like your super religious parents about it because they're like not gonna be on board or they're yeah that's super fascinating and you know <laughs> on that lucky bitch note I want to let you know as I was um I was working on the Courageous Conversation book the other day, and one of the things, I wrote this sentence that was like, you know, something about how to say tough things without being an asshole. And I paused and I was like, should I use the word asshole? I was like, I could <laughs> say jerk, but to be really honest, like, asshole is really the word that I mean. And I'm like, ah, Denise's whole business is called Lucky Bitch. It's fine if I use the word asshole in my book. <laughs> It is. And you know, the funny thing about Lucky Bitch is that one of my greatest fears when I was starting out and even setting boundaries as I was always worried that someone was going to think I was a bitch. You know, it was such a big thing for me. I was like, oh, they're going to think I'm a bitch if I say no. They're going to think I'm a bitch if I say, you know, I can't do that for free for you. You know, you have to pay me for it. And so that was my whole 
I'm like, I can't believe I called my business Lucky Bitch when that was one of my biggest blocks. <laughs> well, of course, we always do stuff like that. What do you think happens to me when I call my stuff Wild Soul Movement and Untame Yourself? I'm constantly being like poked by life to be like, how untamed are you really? Like, how willing to go there are you really? So um, yeah. I want to tell people about the course. So two things. I know that you are running the course live for the first time in like three years now so if anyone's catching this interview in real time it went live on monday october 24th how what's the deadline on them being able to enroll if they want to do it live with you yeah great so yeah we haven't done it for three years and just live just means that we're doing it all together yeah there will be live q a's all that kind of stuff because normally the course is kind of a do it yourself course but then you've got the community there to help you right so that kicks off first week of november but if you want to um, save some money, because I love doing early birds, just to you know, just to incentivize people to join. I'm yeah. not going to lie about that. Um, 27th of October by 9 p.m. Eastern, you can save $503. Cool. <laughs> so instead of 2,000 for the live one, it's it's 1497. Cool. Um, yeah, that's it. And it's um, it's so it's kind of like a live version. It's such a good opportunity to do. Um, the course with the momentum of thousands of other women you know it's if you've been wanting to work on your money blocks now is a great time and if you've ever been wanting to work with me well now is a perfect time too yeah and also I want to I want to speak to that the momentum it's we talk a lot about energy dynamics and things like that on this show and so understand the difference between doing something on your own and doing something within like an energetic collective container of people all over the planet who are focused on the same stuff amazing I'll also note and again I'm very comfortable with this because I've been in your community now for almost five years and that Facebook group it's funny I'm not super active in other people's Facebook groups anymore but a couple weeks ago, when I bought a $2,000 couch, where was the first place I went to celebrate <laughs> that freaking lucky bitch community? I'm like, upgrade! <laughs> yeah, your so velvet couch. My blue velvet Love couch. It. It's still well, not be- here, but I'm so excited. Oh, but that's the thing, too. You need to be in places where people can celebrate, yeah. like, big things and the small things, right? And totally. celebrate talking about money because it's not vulgar to talk about money in the lucky bitch money no. boot camp. People share people share how much they make each month you know like they're literally like here's my spreadsheet how much I made and we can celebrate people who have just made their first like couple hundred bucks and people who have you know crazy amounts of money in one month because of a launch and it's so normal like people are so untriggered by talking about money and success there and you can learn from other people on that so much and, and I mean, I, I know I mentioned this at some point somewhere, maybe even our last interview, but you were where I learned uh, the absolute, absolute importance in any healing or transformation process of decluttering, clearing out the crap that doesn't serve you and doing forgiveness work. Like forgiveness, it has become like a benchmark of my programs and my courses too, because I freaking learned that during the lucky bitch thing. And I always talk about it. I'm like the very first time I did this, it was around money and my list had 74 things on it. And I wanted to puke every time I looked at it. And it took me four days to get all the way through it. And that was like a real huge starting point for me. So for anyone listening, if you have money stuff, cool, but just understand that doing this work, it's going to touch everything in your life. It really oh, seeps yeah. out and it really has, because again, the energetics, you can't put concentrated effort in one area of your life and not also uplift everything else. Oh yeah, absolutely. I even joke and say to people, like, if you want to work on something else, just go through the boot camp and just pretend I'm saying like love or yeah, yeah. <laughs> something else because it's this, it's honestly the same, same work, but you need to do it through a, a particular lens. If you want to work on something, it deserves to go through a lens yeah. and have some dedicated time space for that and um is, do you have a special link can you can you yeah, say it out yeah, loud yeah. or are you going to write just, it in or no we, we'll put it in the show notes too we just made a link to yeah. make it easy if people just go to untameyourself.com forward slash lucky bitch they'll go straight to the page with all the information and they could also read a lot of other women's stories and stuff like that and again you know you might not be into it you might totally be into it but i'm super passionate about this because i used it and it It really, really helped me. And I want to say this too for people though, because this is important in anything, not just Denise's work. I did this course in 2012 and it wasn't really until 2014 that my money got really good. 
So mm. I'm sure there are some people who are like primed to get like an immediate result. But don't expect that like you're going to finish the course and be a millionaire. That might not be the case. For some of you, it'll be the best foundational work you could ever do like it was for me. So like everyone's wow. path and trajectory afterwards might be a little bit different. But like at the core, this is really, really great work. I love how real you are on that, Liz. Like it's no BS. And I totally agree. And I actually saw someone join this week and she was just like, oh, I did this part of it. And like, where's my money? And we're like, honey, we're here to help you unpack your old shit. It's yeah. not going to happen. If it, like, yeah, you're going to have to do some stuff here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and like you said, every time you want to go to a new level, like th- it's like a spiral. We talk about this a lot too. Like you're, you're going to pass by the same stuff. You're, you'll pass by it in like a different <laughs> dimension <laughs> or a different like a higher, yes. stair- a higher piece of the staircase. But, you know, your stuff will circle back around. But you will be, like you said, throughout – You'll be so much better at dealing with it. You won't be triggered by it. Like even my story earlier, you know, two days before your taxes are due, you might be going back through your bookkeeping and instead of feeling like you're going to puke, it's like exciting and it feels good and you're like high-fiving people, you know? So like there's so much yeah. to it. So I hope people go and check it out, untameyourself.com forward slash lucky bitch. And even if you're not listening to this in real time, if you didn't get in on the <coughs> live one, the one where you do it yourself is awesome. The community is still going to be there to support you. Denise answers questions in that group all the time. Yeah. It's awesome. It's really great stuff. So um, anything else you want to share before we roll out? Oh, yes. Um, it's this feeling of when is my time, right? You know, a lot of us are like, when is it going to happen for me? And an affirmation that I use a lot is um, it's my time and I'm ready for the next step. Mm. And that, that really helps because you, you have to realize that no one's going to just – you know, tap you on the shoulder and go, you come on, come with us. It's, it's your time. You have to be the one to, to stand up. And the other part of that is to, um, I started saying to myself, today is my lucky day mm-hmm. because, you know, you, when you think, oh, I'll wait for Mercury retrograde to be over or maybe when I've lost like five kilograms or, you know, five pounds, um, then I'll, then I'll be ready. And you have to just go, no, today is my lucky day. And I'm totally ready for this. I'm totally ready to, to move on and, and go to the next step. So it's, it's a calling. It's a calling for all of us to step up as leaders in, in the way that works for us yeah. in that yeah. in a beautiful way that works for us, but it's a calling. It's now, it's now it's happening. <laughs> It's now. It's It's, it's really now. So, Denise, thank you so much. And for anyone watching or listening, as always, if you want to comment on this, if you have a question about this, come on over into the Facebook group, untameyourself.com forward slash Facebook. Um, We're going to put links to all the things in the show notes. You have the link to the show notes from the intro. And that's it. Denise, thank you so much. We will talk to you later. Thank you. I love this interview so much, Liz. I love what you do. I love your – I've loved watching your transition um, and stepping into yourself over the last couple of years. So inspiring. Uh, and you're just doing amazing work in the world. So thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. It's so interesting to me that you can go to university in the United States and pretty much most other countries from what I've seen. And you can, you can take astonishing classes with amazing professors in, to gain a certain amount of domain experience and intelligence and, and expertise and knowledge. Um, but there are very few practices or very few classes, very few degrees or programs that will allow you to gain that same level of knowledge about you, about who you are, what matters to you, what your strengths and gifts and talents are, what you believe is critically important, how, you know, what relationships and how you want to relate to the world. It's sort of like, you know, the, you're, you're left to do that with a coach or a therapist um, on you know on the side, if that's something that you feel you need to do, and generally you do that, you know, as a part of navigating crisis, rather than no, actually this this could and should be a critical part of the education of every human being who has access to some sort of educational system.